Hello listeners and welcome to the Montel Weekly Podcast, bringing you energy matters in an informal setting. This week's topic is hydrogen. In mid-February, the European Commission finally published new rules that define green hydrogen as part of its renewable energy directive. Many years in the making, the rules, in EU jargon labelled delegated acts, will provide much needed clarity for the sector. Joining me, Richard Sverson, to discuss what these delegated acts, the new rules, what they mean for the sector, is Catherine Banet, who is Professor of Law at the University of Oslo. A very warm welcome to you, Catherine. Thank you very much, Richard. Maybe before we we go into the sort of nitty gritty of the new rules, maybe we can discuss the different kinds of hydrogen there are, because there's there's quite a sort of confusing colour coding going on, green, purple, blue, uh, grey, maybe maybe purple is an exaggeration, but uh, could you just briefly say what, what... how they are defined at the moment. I would insist on their uh, use of the legal definitions in the directive because it's often easier to communicate with the colors, but the definition matters. And actually, I would refer to renewable hydrogen and low carbon hydrogen when, during our conversation. But to put it simply, the difference between the different colors is the source of production of hydrogen. Therefore, it's easy to uh, communicate based on the fact that you have green hydrogen for uh, hydrogen production based on renewables or uh, gray hydrogen from natural gas, blue natural gas with CCS, and then you have other combinations as you referred to. So what are the new rules? What are these delegated acts? So we have two delegated acts that have been put forward by the European Commission on the 10th of February 2023. And they are in accordance with the Renewable Energy Directive that is from December 2018 on the promotion of the use of energy from renewable sources. In the directive, to be precise, Article 27.3, there is a requirement that the European Commission adopt uh, delegated acts, the precise element of Uh, the uh, calculation rules for uh, the minimum shares of renewable energy in the transport sector. So we are in the nitty-gritty details Um. of uh, the implementation of uh, those criteria, but those are crucial for the calculation of notably the additionality and the emission savings um, for the different fuels and for accounting the renewable hydrogen towards EU targets. So we have two delegated acts. We have one that relates to additionality, and I guess we will come back to that. And the second one that uh, defines rules on the methodology for calculating life cycle greenhouse gas emissions for the so-called RFNBOs. How's that spelt out? That seems to be another element of, of, of EU jargon then. No, uh, indeed. That's a, that's a new acronym that many now have been used to, and they refer to uh, renewable fuels of non-biological origin, and uh, they are produced from renewable electricity. They are uh, fundamental as well uh, in terms of ensuring the increase of renewable energy-based uh, hydrogen uptake, in particular in sectors uh, where uh, it is uh, expected to rely on liquid and gaseous fuels in the long term, such as maritime and aviation. And this concept of additionality is, is crucial here, isn't it? There's a separate uh, delegated act on, on that. Um, what, what, in a nutshell, is this all about? Uh, and why is it important, Catherine? Indeed, additionality is the topic of one of the two delegated acts. And additionality is both key, and it has been controversial during the negotiation, but it is key in order to ensure that we have renewable hydrogen production via electrolyzers that do not use renewable energy that would also otherwise be used to um, provide uh, zero carbon electricity to the grid. This relates in other words, to the requirements that new electrolyzing capacity is supplied by renewable electricity from new dedicated sources. And there is a link here in the delegated acts. And in a way, we are uh, calculating additionality to what is called temporal and geographic correlation. What does that mean? So you're linking it to uh, the time frame in which it's produced and the area in which it's 
producer. Exactly. So that's the uh, criteria to ensure that renewable hydrogen is only produced when and where sufficient energy is available. So that's the temporal and geographic correlation. But it also ensures that you have consistency in the way you define uh, what is renewable, that you do not necessarily have imported uh, renewable energy to produce um, hydrogen in Sweden while the sources are from Italy. So you have requirements in terms of the time of the production, but as well the location of the production. And these issues were also highly debated between the stakeholders. Now we rely primarily on the fact that you should have a direct connection uh, but as well uh, as an alternative that uh, you could uh, rely on the uh, definition of the limit for the bedding zone or if there is cross-border trade as well, what kind of uh, criteria are laid down in the um, bidding zone of the other countries in order to uh, fulfill the requirements. Before we go on and discuss it in a little bit more detail, Catherine, why, why is this? Why was the concept of additionality then so controversial? And what were the main objections? So the main objection was related to uh, the fact that the new renewable uh, hydrogen production should not cannibalize existing renewable energy sources. That uh, is also um, an observation that we do not have sufficient uh, renewable electricity capacity today and therefore that we should not uh, divert the production that we need to fit into the grid by uh, supporting renewable uh, hydrogen in that way. So that is uh, uh, encapsulated by the concept of uh, canonization uh, from existing arrests. When will the rules take effect? The rules will take effect once the Delegated Act enter into force. And now we're, there is a uh, certain uncertainty around that because the two delegated acts, so adopted by the European Commission, finally, I remind you that they should have been adopted already in uh, December um, 2021. Uh, uh, then uh, the European Commission has adopted these two acts and it is now subject to a two-month scrutiny period by the Council and the Parliament. This is standard procedure under uh, Article 290 of the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. And uh, if the two co-legislators do not object uh, to that delegated act, then it is published uh, in the official journal of the EU with an entry into force fixed in the uh, regulation to 20 days. We already have an extension by the European Parliament. It was adopted the 20. Uh, 3rd of February of two months. So that means that we already have two months plus two months. How enforceable are these acts? I mean, uh, in practice, they they require a lot of monitoring and certification. So I mean, is it, you know, it seems to be um, quite a complex piece of, of legislation. Uh, we are in a period of detailed, complex uh, regulation. And this is a good example of that. We will have first two make sure that we enable the transition period and then we have uh, the full implementation of the rules that rely on uh, strict rules for the operators, for the producers of the fuels uh, with uh, the metering, with the uh, measuring of uh, the electricity that will be fit into the installations, how uh, they comply as well with uh, the different criteria for emissions um, uh, reductions. And as well, uh, there will be a process of certification that is voluntary, but that will enable both EU, so domestic producers, but as well third country producers to uh, recognize their um, electricity as um, renewables uh, for the production of uh, hydrogen, renewable hydrogen. And do you see a need that they will perhaps, you know, there's a need to be updated or changed uh, or dropped um, given the negotiations on the on ongoing uh, Renewable Energy Directive? The uh, directive provides for a review clause. With a report, it is standard uh, provisions or a, a report to be submitted by the European Commission on the implementation of the rules. So indeed, uh, uh, there will be an assessment made by the Commission and a possible adjustment. But that will remain uh, the uh, 
general regime until that. And we are talking 2028 uh, for the preview clause. Have these rules been welcomed by the, by the sector, by the hydrogen or the renewables industry generally? Um, what effect will they have on the development of, of green hydrogen in particular? They have been both welcomed because highly expected, uh, notably in terms of clarification of the rules of the game and investments as well. Uh, but at the same time, they have been uh, criticised for still being too weak or too vague. So if we take the positive sides, the positive uh, effects of the uh, delegated act is first to have clarification around the definition of renewable hydrogen. So that's good. Clarification about the methodologies and the criteria for additionality, temporal geographical correlation, emissions accounting. The fact that we will now have certification schemes that needs as well to, to be further elaborated at national level. And uh, not least that you have now clarification around uh, the criteria for commodity that can be traded. So there are some commercial aspects in addition to the fact that they could count towards uh, the targets of the EU. So that's on the positive side. If we look at the more controversial aspect, I mentioned additionality before, but there are uh, still some criticism regarding uh, the fact that uh, they are too weak in terms of allowing producers from um, electrolytic hydrogen uh, operational before a certain threshold date, so 2029, to benefit from some exemptions. Uh, and as well that you have unclarity around uh, the uh, voluntary schemes and national schemes that will remain. So those have still been uh, labeled as a uh, ground standard for greenwashing. I uh, will not be uh, so critical, but we, we see that it is a challenging area when we want at the same time ensure that we are in line with climate neutrality uh, goals and uh, further production of renewables, but at the same time enabling the transition. There's been some, I mean, another part that has maybe been criticized uh, quite heavily or slightly controversial is the fact that nuclear power can be seen as as, as zero carbon or largely carbon neutral um, generation uh, in the terms of producing hydrogen. Is, is that a correct assessment of, of the rules as they stand? I would be uh, more careful because here that's a very good example of uh, the interlinkages between the different legislative acts. What was uh, the main point here is that the uh, countries, so including France, uh, with a high share of renewable nuclear energy in their energy mix, uh, would have liked as well to uh, see a recognition of this share in the definition of low carbon hydrogen counting towards the targets. But when we talk about low carbon hydrogen, we're already talking about another directive, another uh, regulation that's under uh, another legislative package on hydrogen and decarbonized gas markets. The compromise uh, that has been uh, reached is uh, therefore to have separate rules uh, on low carbon hydrogen uh, in, in that package and uh, the rules on uh, emissions accounting under the Delegated Act. So we can see the discussion on uh, nuclear energy counting as renewable in different ways through these delegated acts. We have the one of the uh, bidding zones. So to which extent in the bidding zone, nuclear energy will be um, fed in. And if that's a certain percentage, but that the um, threshold for um, the criteria are met, then nuclear energy can still be a part of that uh, mix. The second is under uh, the rules for uh, greenhouse gas emissions savings uh, under the other delegated act on the methodology for the calculation. And finally, outside these two delegated acts, we have the uh, negotiations under the hydrogen and decarbonized gas markets package, where we will have a discussion about new definitions, notably low carbon hydrogen. And here there will be an issue as well of consistency between the two uh, legislative um, uh, packages. So we, you can say that the de delegated act in a way creates type of loophole uh, by which renewable hydrogen can be produced to a certain extent from nuclear uh, energy. So there, there is 
a, a loophole or a small uh, window here. But it would be maybe an over, oversimplification to say that uh, producing hydrogen by nuclear power is 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 basically labeling it as green. In my view, yes. Yeah. Okay. That's very. That's. I mean, that's good to have that clarified. I think that, Ketrin. I think. Um, do you think the delegated acts, the, the new uh, rules, do they give enough clarity for investors and developers to kickstart the industry? I mean, we hear a lot of, of plans in the pipeline. Um, uh, do you think this will bring about more activity, um, more investment in, in, in hydrogen facilities across Europe? For sure, these rules under the two delegated acts were highly expected. I mentioned the need to provide for clear definition as well accounting rules. Uh, so that's a very positive element. That also provides clarity in terms of the way of trading renewable hydrogen and to valorize that uh, under the uh, different agreements. Um, and that is both relevant for uh, hydrogen uh, agreements, so trading agreements, but as well for uh, the power purchase agreements that are also recognized in the delegated act on additionality. That's an important element. So supporting corporates PPAs. Uh, but it is not uh, the only thing that will support investment certainty. And here I would like to insist on the fact that this is only one piece in a bigger puzzle. It uh, also will be dependent on further clarification under other processes under the Renewable Energy Directive, so RED2, notably in terms of uh, sensorization work that is ongoing. You will need as well a, a clarification uh, under uh, the now recast uh, uh, hydrogen gas uh, uh, directive, as well in terms of uh, energy infrastructure investment under stated rules that are also under revision, notably uh, due to the Green Deal Industrial Plan and the uh, revision of the general block exemption regulation. You have the taxonomy regulation as well uh, with the criteria for sustainable investment. And finally, you have the big EU funding schemes and initiatives that will also influence the shaping of uh, the bigger projects. So this is really a complex puzzle. And I think the, the, the challenge here will be to have consistent rules. So Catherine, what, what kind of subsidies could we see in Europe for hydrogen? What, what are your expectations here? I mean, there is a big you know, almost a transatlantic battle going on for, for subsidies um, with the um, the US's Inflation Reduction Act and, and the, the Repower EU and what the re European response would be. Do you, How do you see that evolving? You're talking about subsidies. So here we already need to uh, distinguish between the financial support and the regulatory support. And I think here that both are equally important. If we look at the financial support, we uh, see a, a wide area of different tools, as we have seen for 20 years ago with renewable energy sources, but they have matured over time. Uh, when you talk about the um, US uh, Inflation Reduction Act here, a tax rebate, for example, they play an important role of that, in that. Uh, when we look at the European landscape, we have as well a quite diverse uh, toolbox uh, used by the member states primarily, and this is topped by EU initiatives. We have um, operating aid, investment aid, uh, what is expected to be as well very popular is the use of contract for difference uh, that is proposed in different uh, states. Something that is uh, important to stress is that the support will be different according to the size of the project. And with hydrogen, uh, we are talking about different uh, sizes of hydrogen production and transport, because we need both support for production, but as well for development and infrastructure. If we don't have the infrastructure to carry uh, the uh, hydrogen produce, it will go nowhere. So here we have to uh, think about how to put the different pieces of the value chain together and how to have a consistent financial uh, support for that. That means production, but as well, how do you organize storage? How do you organize conversion and uh, both transmission, distribution level? Uh, that is not distinguished in the proposal from the European Commission, but that I would like to see uh, uh, carried on. 
Uh, so uh, distinction between transmission, distribution, etc. And here you may need different financial tools. Some recent EU legislation has been sort of criticised by by elements of the industry because it gives too much space for for member states to to interpret in their own way. Um, maybe you know in some senses or resulting in a in a patchwork of regulation. How do the the new the, the hydrogen delegated acts um, compare in this sense? There, there is again a good example of combination of harmonized rules and some uh, room for appreciation for the member states. And this is where, of course, uh, there must be a careful assessment. Uh, we uh, see that there are clear rules in terms of um, which uh, electricity can be counted for renewable hydrogen production. Uh, there is clarification in terms uh, as well of the date uh, of permitting of the infrastructures. That was also controversial. I, I mentioned that er earlier. And we have now, uh, in addition, some flexibility, some discretion left to the member states. For example, in order to address national specificities of the bidding zones and to support the integrated planning of electricity and hydrogen networks, very important for system integration. In that view, the member states um, can be allowed to set out additional criteria concerning the location of the electrolyzers within the bathing zones. So this is uh, already some uh, room left to member states. There is also uh, flexibility left to the operators them themselves, where uh, the fuel producers could combine different options for counting electricity that is used for the production of renewable um, hydrogen. And as well, in order to verify whether the rules uh, have been followed correctly uh, through the support schemes, there is room for choosing the support scheme. There is very little said in the Delegated Act around that. But when it comes to the, the, the key elements around uh, criteria for the recognition and avoiding double counting, this is necessary to have uh, EU harmonization. Absolutely. There's a lot of talk of, of the bidding zones here as well, uh, Catherine. Does that mean that it, these new rules are firmly embedded in the market structure? Indeed, I think they are embedded in uh, the physical reality of the grids, that uh, we are uh, in a context of uh, developed electricity grids, but as well more decentralized grid. We have issues of congestions that uh, will increase over time, and we have the cross-border element. And this physical reality is reflected by the bidding zone uh, mechanism. Uh, so yes, they're using the uh, rules that are in place for the electricity market. But these delegated acts have also been contested by some member states, haven't they, Catherine? Indeed. Some member states, but as well as the corridors, have raised the issue of possible legal contest, as we have seen with the taxonomy regulation. These arguments related primarily to uh, the weakening of the additionality principle and uh, the fact that the Commission could have exceeded its delegated powers under the Delegated Act and the Renewable Energy Directive. They also relate to uh, the fact that the Delegated Act must be consistent with the energy efficiency principle and uh, energy solidarity principle. And finally, due to the fact that uh, the, there is a requirement of assessing as well uh, the Delegated Act against uh, the EU's climate target under the European climate uh, law. So let's see if uh, some stakeholders or member states want to push that argument further and uh, therefore there will be some risk of legal contest. Have there been any indications of who will, will bring that to the, to the fore, that kind of um, legal case? Yeah, so far uh, the NGOs have been the more vocal uh, and therefore, um, since the member states have not raised so many issues, the risk is pretty low. But we have seen with taxonomy regulation that Austria was very vocal uh, and, and uh, started as well proceedings. So it could also happen. Thanks very much for providing the, the clarity on, on these delegated acts, uh, as they're called. And um, let's see if they, they spur a lot more activity in the sector. So thank you very much, Catherine Bennett, for joining the Montel Weekly Podcast. Thank you very much, Richard. So listeners, you can now follow the podcast on our own Twitter account, aptly named the Montel Weekly Podcast. Please direct message, any suggestions, questions, or, you know, let us know if you, if you think you have a good idea for a guest on the show. 
You can also send us an email to podcast at montelnews.com. Lastly, remember to keep up to date with all that's happening in energy markets on Montel News. You can subscribe on Apple Podcasts and Spotify or wherever you get your podcasts from. Thank you and goodbye.